Hello, I'm Tom Rothman of 20th Century Fox. Welcome to Fox Legacy. We're happy to have you with us. The library of films that 20th Century Fox owns, created over the course now of nearly 75 years, contains over 3,000 films. They number among them nine Academy Award Best Pictures, 17 Oscars for Best Actor or Actress, countless films of great cultural, historical, or artistic importance, not to mention the highest grossing motion picture in history. And the halls of Building 88, where I work, are lined with photos and posters from a selection of the best of those films. And I guess I could have had any one of those classic films represented on the wall outside of my own office. Indeed, my partner, Jim Giannopoulos, chose the poster from the incomparable 1964 film, Zorba the Greek, to mark his door. Giannopoulos, Zorba. Makes a certain sense. But if you come see me at Fox, and you walk down the long hall of Building 88, out of all of those 3,000 films, the poster to look for to find my door is the one from Brian De Palma's 1974 rock musical horror comedy genre bending curioso, Phantom of the Paradise. Now, the reason I chose that particular poster is not really because I admire De Palma's work, though I do greatly, especially his early underground films, or because of the stylistic flourishes that abound in it, or even because its score by the star of the film, Paul Williams, was nominated for an Academy Award. No, the reason I chose that poster is more personal. You see, when Phantom of the Paradise was first released in 1974, I was a 20-year-old college student. My older brother, an actor who I worshiped then and now, and I were at our home in Baltimore. And he said he had a movie he wanted me to see. So we went together to the late great Mayfair Theater on Howard Street in Baltimore. This in the days before it went triple X. And I sat in the balcony, something by the way I still love to do where they can be found. And for those of you in LA, I recommend the village in Westwood. Anyway, there we were, the only two people in the entire theater to watch Phantom of the Paradise. Now this was a film quite unlike any my provincial Baltimore upbringing had exposed me to before. Early in the film, there appears a girl, so beautiful and with such an exquisite voice that the Phantom immediately falls in love with her. Well, in the theater, my brother nudged me and said, you see that girl? I know her in New York. Now, in truth, I don't remember much of what I was or wasn't thinking back in those days. But I do remember with crystal clarity what I thought right then. You know her, I thought? It's possible to know girls who look like that? If so, that's it. I'm getting out of this town and I'm going where those girls are. And eventually, I managed to do that. But the story comes fuller circle, you see, because the girl that the Phantom fell in love with is named Jessica Harper. Caught up in your wheel and dealing, you've got no time left for simple feeling. I thought I knew you, but I didn't know you at all. And 15 years after I first saw Phantom of the Paradise, I went the Phantom himself one better 
And I married that very girl. But 20 years later, we are still married. Ladies and gentlemen, our first guest star on Fox Legacy, the incandescent phoenix and the chick I sold my soul for, <laughs> Jessica Harper. Hi, honey. Hi, dear. How was the intro? Well, it was a little understated, but it <laughs> Naturally. was nice. Right. No, it was very good job. All right. You're well, thank good. you for coming. Tell everyone how you came to be in Phantom of the Paradise. Oh, how I got the part. Yep. Well, it was my own private showbiz fairy tale. I was just a hoofer in an off-Broadway musical in New York. Called? Dr. Salovey's Magic Theater. Mm -hmm. Richard Foreman directed. And, uh, but it got great reviews. So everybody in New York came to see it, including Brian De Palma. There we go. So he liked me. He flew me out to Hollywood. Right. Put me up at the Chateau Marmont Natural. Hotel. Took me out for dinner with Marty Scorsese. The, the whole thing. <laughs> the whole thing, the whole nine yards. <laughs> right. Next morning I get up, I go have a screen test, and guess who my competition was? Who? Oh. Linda Ronstead. Really? Guess who got the part? There we go. I did. History. History. Well. Although, actually, I guess I, maybe I could have been married to Linda Ronstadt. Uh, uh, I don't think so, not. honey. All right. <laughs> oh, well, they've heard enough from me. You take over and throw it to the film. Oh, I get to sit in your chair? Yes, dear. Thank you. As you will hear Rod Serling say in his inimitable voice over the title sequence, this movie is about Swan. He has no other name. A genius rock entrepreneur, he brought the blues to Britain, he brought Liverpool to America, he brought rock and folk together. His house is littered with gold records, and he's a really good kisser. Now, he's looking for a new sound, a new music, with which he will inaugurate his own private rock palace, the Paradise. And that's what this movie is about. It's about the search for that music, the man who wrote it, the girl who sang it, hello, and the monster who stole it. So sit back and enjoy the ride, Phantom of the Paradise. So, it always ends down for the Phantom in every version of that damn story. Well, for the movie itself, it was down, up, down, and then weirdly up. You see, De Palma wrote the script at the height of the counterculture explosion in 1969, but no studio wanted anything to do with it. And it took five years until producer Ed Pressman was able to raise the money to finance the film on his own. When it was done, however, well, then it seemed right in tune with the Alice Cooper, Pink Floyd, Jesus Christ superstar, Ziggy Stardust times. And so, the script that every studio in town passed on was suddenly the movie that every studio was bidding on. Fox won the bidding, paying $2 million for a film that had cost only $1.3 million to make. And that $2 million at the time was the highest price the company had ever paid to acquire a completed film. And boy, do I wish that was still true, but that's a story for another day. In the end, though, in the up and down and good and bad world that is show business, sometimes the winner is the loser, and the loser is the winner. You see, the genre mix that makes Phantom so cool today was, as De Palma has often said about a lot of his work, ahead of its time. The audience in 1974 didn't know what the hell to make of it, and the movie bombed. Remember I told you that my brother and I were the only two people in the audience in Baltimore? Well, unfortunately, it wasn't just Baltimore. And Fox, the big winner in the bidding, turned out to be the big loser for the moment. But you see, things changed again. First cable television, and then the DVD revolution, brought movies a new life, and Phantom of the Paradise has gone on to be a true cult hit and to find new fans in each successive generation of adventurous movie lovers. Indeed, in Winnipeg, Canada, of all places on Earth, Phantom of the Paradise has gone with the wind. For whatever reason, no one really knows, the movie was a huge hit in Winnipeg, 
It played in theaters for 62 consecutive weeks. The soundtrack to the movie sold 50,000 copies in Winnipeg alone. I didn't know there were that many people in Winnipeg. Fans there have been so devoted that they created the Fantapalooza Festival, which features screenings and live performances from Paul Williams and the band in the movie, The Juicy Fruits. And one year, even an appearance by the Phoenix herself. Ooh, the famous Phoenix fedora. <laughs> That's right. There it is. <laughs> Luckily for me, though, I see her every day. And for that reason, Phantom of the Paradise is my single favorite film from 20th Century Fox. Well, what about some of my other pictures, like Suspiria? Oh. That's a Fox movie. Right. Don't I have some other? Never marry an actress, folks. <laughs> Say goodnight. All right, I will.